Well, everyone, it finally happened. Joe Lonsdale was finally able to get Alex Karp to sit down, join him on his own podcast, The American Optimist. This is an incredible episode spanning nearly one hour long, and his team was very gracious enough to share with me some early access to the episode. I've watched the entire thing. I think it's certainly worth watching through in its entirety. However, in this video, I've chopped up some of my favorite clips directly focused on Palantir, the product, the philosophy, where it's going, and everything you need to know about Foundry and Gotham from this podcast in particular. It's so awesome to see these two co-founders connecting. Even though Lonsdale is no longer directly involved, he is obviously one of the best and most capable interviewers of Palantir's current CEO. So overall, an incredible episode, and I hope you enjoy these clips and the full podcast. You know, building Palantir together are engineers. Yeah, the, be Some, the very best in the world. The very, very best in the world are the brain structure is different. People think that there's like, you know, they're with a standard deviation of the best if you're the second best, but it's not, it's, it's just a different universe. It's not true. Yeah. And you see this in software and building software products. The very best in the world, the people who built PG, they're, the brain structure, the way of solving problems, there are very few people who could, could have pulled that off. For whatever reason, I think I have some kind of weird ability where, you know, I have picked some of the best and managed some of the best engineers in the world consistently. Like it, five years ago, CIOs didn't buy our product. Now they do. Because it's like, there's this like plasticity of, of learning in the US, which is something that I think other countries struggle with. The, I, our times getting Palantir off the ground were just crazy magical, dangerous, scary. We almost went out of business a lot of times. And in fact, except for the fact that we were so maniacally focused on getting this thing to work, it would never have worked because no one wanted to invest in us. All the top VCs were like, this is a, it's a crazy idea to, to be interested in data, working with large institutions. We, we did have a little bit of an attitude that I think you and I shared, which was like the famous, you know, kid team is Caesar Vius, which is, you know, why are you afraid? Like you're, you're carrying the people who are going to be successful, right? To the famous boatman with Julius Caesar. There's something like that, which I don't think it was necessarily arrogance. It was just a sense that we have to no, win. We were and we're so, going I mean, to win. maybe look, well, I think we were arrogant, but in some ways, we were too, in some places we were too arrogant. In some places we weren't That's arrogant fair. enough. That's fair. Like, you know, if we had gone into the VCs and been like, fuck you, we're going to win. They probably would have given us money. Do you have any, any favorite stories from some of those VC meetings? And I we were ironically too modest with those people. How I, and then sometimes too yeah. arrogant with like government people yeah. and others where we're like... I, me yeah. as a 22 year old was probably not the right person to sell to the government. That was, that was complicated, but yeah. That's but in fairness to us... We, we, were, we were the first to break in. A lot of other companies have now come in and some are doing very well. No, I'm able to do a lot in defense now, thanks to Palantir, and then SpaceX and, and others, right? And, well, yeah. we, we showed yeah. up, we, we succeeded, which again, none of this matters if you're like some academic project, you don't succeed. Yeah. We sued the government not to buy our product, but to ensure that people bought products that worked uh, because the most important thing in my view that can happen for the, the preservation of the West and its values is for the US military to be by far the best in the world. What are a couple things they could do to, to fix it and be better? Obviously they've changed, they've improved. Like what, 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 they've what do you changed, want to see they've do? improved. The rebuttable presumption is if a product is world-class, it is A, built in America. Again, rebuttable doesn't always mean, but very likely it is you could get drilled down on that. It's built by this, da, 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 but just it is a product and somebody commercially has bought that product. Yeah. It, it, it is very non-plausible that you would have the best software product in the world and no one, you've never sold it commercially oh, because you don't have time to make your company be worth $50 billion. Um, it is not a product. Okay, so that means you will never scale it. And by the way, that also, there's a lot there because you want the world's best engineers to work on something, the ones that can do things no one else can. Tell them you want to not build products and see how far that goes. Yeah. And again, for reasons that are complicated and hard to understand, it almost as invariably is built in America, most likely on the West Coast, but not exclusively on the West Coast anymore. The U.S. government should have a policy where a small percent of all, especially the DOD, a small percent of its spend has to go to products built in the 
software built in the United States that is a product that has been proven both on the battlefield and has been in some derivative sold commercially. But the insiders are all doing like cost plus contracts, right? So they're well, still doing that. If you want to reform institution, you've got to start by reforming parts of it. So I would just say, starting now, 1% has to go for this. 1% of $900 billion is roughly the budget. It's like, yeah. and then every six months, it goes up by a percent. Or you could even say every year, because in the end, and by the way, that would change the number of people selling to the DOD. Because if you, once you see a tiny sliver is going to this thing. It's working. People are like, but it not only works, it's the best in the world. This thing is scaring our enemies. Yeah. You know, Americans right now are very motivated inside the DOD to scare our enemies. We, we have a slight bias here at Palantir. We build a software that will allow you to process large language models, rebuild the output of large language models, turn it into what we call an agent, which is a safe algorithm you can run across your enterprise, and we can interact back and forth with large language models or, or other forms of AI so that the, the algorithm of large man, large male understands your enterprise, but you don't outsource the knowledge of your enterprise to the large language model. So I, I believe that that will be the future and that these things implemented correctly, large language models and AI are a crazy advantage over people who don't. And you could just take very simple examples on margins and business, efficiency and allocation, being able, resource allocation, um, uh, rebuilding your enterprise so that you get the most efficient parts at the right time. But um, on healthcare, pharmaceuticals, uh, hospital care, we had basically very few clients last year. And now I think we power allocation at 15, between 13 and 14% of all hospital bed allocation in the country. Wow. We have, um, and it's simply because um, the people in these industries know that they need instruments to increase efficiency and productivity. Part of the reason why it was hard to do this is the use case they have is very difficult because you have to increase productivity with low margins under harsh conditions, meaning you will, mm -hmm. You can get sued. You do get sued. There are hip. There are privacy protections that are the most sacrosanct in the world. How the algorithm is used, uh, and how that algorithm then leads back to efficiency without be getting into hot water either morally, institutionally, or legally. Palantir is ideal for that. Yeah. And so, but again, it's precisely because one of the most amazing things in business is no one believes that we're you know that Palantir's deep understanding of uh, the technical issues that involve data protection, civil liberties, are things that generated our product. Yes, but if you're dealing with this use case, there's only one engine you can use because we've spent 20 years thinking and building products for this. And, and interestingly, it's the kind of things you use to identify adversaries with software mm -hmm. uh, also presuppose uh, um, a, a data protection, civil liberties bias. It's not just find enemy, it's yeah. find enemy. Is this the stupid general we want to keep alive? We are in a software world. America is by far the best at enterprise software. You see this, you saw this before AI and large language models. I think at this point, it's kind of hard to ignore. We have, we continue to attract and retain the best talent in the world. We have cultural and cultural systems for managing that talent and turning that into productive companies like some of the ones you support and finance and I would say most notably Palantir.